Can we read the word? Philippians chapter 3. We'll, we'll begin uh, by reading Philippians chapter 3 and verse 1 to 14. And then we will head on to a few pointers that I'd like to give as my concluding words for today. Philippians chapter 3, verse 1 to 14. Finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious, but for you it is safe. Beware of dogs, beware of evil workers, beware of the mutilation. For we are the circumcision who worship God in the spirit. Rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in my flesh. Though I also might have confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks that he may have confidence in the flesh, I more so. Circumcise the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, concerning the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, concerning the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, these things I have counted loss for Christ. Yet indeed, I also count all things loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having my own righteousness which is from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness which is from God by faith, that I may know Him. Come on, one more time, loudly. That I may know Him and the power of His resurrection and the fellowship of His sufferings being confirmed to His death. If by any means I may attain to the resurrection from the dead, not that I have already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. And everybody said an amen. So Paul is telling us how it is necessary to let go of the past. If there's one thing that we can, and I hope that we take it very, very seriously from this campus to let go of the past, is to disconnect from our history so that we can concentrate on what lies ahead, to, to focus on what God is about to do in the days ahead. The second thing that we focused on last night was the necessary necessity to count certain things as rubbish, to devalue certain things, to, to deprioritize certain things. And the third thing that I would like to emphasize on this morning is what we read in verse 14. It says, I now press towards, press on towards the upward calling, towards the upward call in God which has been given to me through Christ Jesus. There is a, a call. There is, a, there is an invitation from heaven for each and every one of us. There is a call. There is an invitation. How we will respond to this invitation, how we will value this invitation will determine how, how potential our life will be, how much potential our life will have. Some of us, we, you know, we do things in such a way that there is potential, but we, we are only able to reach 10% of our full potential. Some of us, 50%, some of us, 90%. But God desires for us to have 100% fruit, 100% results, 100% uh, of our potential. And it is necessary that we find out what is this upward call to which God has called us. Now, there are so many things, but you know, with my limited time, I'm going to focus on five things that 
I, I was impressed on my heart to teach you this morning and invite you into that call. Invite you into that call to uh, just, just, you know, become more and more like Jesus. See, this calling is not to become a pastor. This calling is not to become an evangelist. This calling is to become like Jesus. And the thing with Jesus is that Jesus, he, he is not somebody who is just sitting in heaven and giving us orders and instructions. He is someone who set a role model and an example for us by coming down as a human being and dying on the cross for our sins, making sure there is a solution created for the problem that there was. He is not just asking you to somehow manage your sin, somehow avoid your sin. He, he, he's somebody who's saying, I am willing to put myself on the line. Philippians chapter 2, it's a very famous scripture. The Bible says, though he was God, he did not uh, cling to that equality with God as something that he can grasp to and just, you know, and, and just enjoy forever. Instead, he humbled himself. He clothed himself as a human being to the point he humbled himself to the point of death, the Bible says, a, a criminal's death on the cross. And that is why God the Father exalted him, gave him a name that is above every other name. Now, today, my request to us is that we would be willing to humble ourselves. We would be willing to do some things foolish, some things that are out of the ordinary, some things that we, we've never been uh, taught to do or we've never been pulled to do, that when we go out of this place, that there will be a plan of action on how we are going to live our lives. So the first calling is that we are called to witness about Jesus. We are called to talk about our transformation story. We are called to talk about our relationship with Jesus. It's impossible for somebody who has experienced a a good thing for not to not talk about that good thing that they have experienced. Have you ever met that one friend of yours who, you know, let's say they, they went and they saw an IPL match and for the next one week, the only thing they talk about is that IPL match or how good that was and how crazy it was, how fun that was. Or, or that one friend who, you know, they, they went to, you know, let's say Thailand on a holiday and for the next one year, they're only talking about Thailand, you know? They're only talking about the, the water, the, the air, the, you know, the, you know or, or else, you know, some of us, when, when, I, when I come back from traveling abroad, the one thing that I keep talking about is how good their roads are, you know, how, how well they drive on the roads. And every time I'm on the road, I'm like, man, I wish we will drive like them. And anybody that drives with me, they will know how they drive back there and what they do and what they don't do. And, and we, we, when we experience something, it is natural for us to boast about it, talk about it, and, and, and tell others about it. And yet something happens when we experience Jesus. We feel that others will not understand what I have experienced. Others cannot, uh, you know, or probably I cannot explain it in the best way possible or that this is, this is not my job, this is the job of the pastor or the evangelist, this is the job of the guys who have studied in a Bible college, and, and we think that we are unqualified to talk about Jesus. And that is where my role model in this is the Samaritan woman who was talking to Jesus at the well. Like, I can imagine if the disciples of Jesus evangelized the whole town of Samaria, but it was this woman who was having a conversation with Jesus at the well. The Bible says she went and brought the entire town of Samaria to Jesus. Now they spoke to Jesus, they received from Jesus, and they went back and told her, now we believe because we have seen him ourselves. We have heard him ourselves, not because you have told us. Can you imagine how powerful this lady's testimony was? She was not a Bible school graduate. In fact, she has not even been saved for one week. She has not even, you know, I, I don't know, was she baptized? I don't know if she, 
could prophesy. I don't know if, if she could do anything. All that she knew was to go and tell people, I met a man who knows everything about me. I met a man who told me everything that I have done. I met a man who knows my destiny. I met this Jesus. And if I met him, you need to meet him also. And that, that came as a natural response of the fact that her heart was healed. See, Jesus did not tell this woman, now on the way back, please, this is what I want you to do. I want you to go and, you know, evangelize five people. You know, in, in church, sometimes we make programs around evangelism and we tell people, hey, now every week at least share the gospel with five people or, you know, we, 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 we're trying to encourage people with, with practical tips. But this lady, she did not need any encouragement. It, it was that her relationship with Jesus, her encounter with Jesus was so real that she could not hide it anymore, that she had to bring more people into that encounter. My hope is that today, the validity of what you've experienced in these two days, what God has spoken to you in these two days, the validity of your relationship with God will be tested and proved by your willingness to now go out there and share it with other people. I'm going to read 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9. It says, but you are not like that. You are a chosen people. Everybody say chosen people. You are royal priests. Everybody say royal priests. And you are a holy nation. Everybody say holy nation. You are God's very own possession. And as a result, you can show others the goodness of God, for He called you out of the darkness into His wonderful light. God is saying, now your identity is changed. Now your identity is that you are a, a chosen people, a holy nation, a royal priest, a, a special possession of God. Now, why is God giving you this special identity? He says, so that you can go and tell others about the goodness of God. You can show forth the praises of the one who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It is necessary that when we have experienced this goodness of God, we will automatically begin to share it with others. We will automatically begin to talk about it to others. Now, please understand, the, the best way to, to talk about Jesus to others is just open up your life. Just say, this is who I was. Uh, this, this couple of weeks back, I was in this particular airport, and my host, they arranged for this uh, uh, guy who will get me this express check-in, you know, so I don't have to wait at any counters or any queues. And, and so I think this is the Air India, one of the Air India staff. He, he, he was just ushering me past the security and everything. And, and I was just having a conversation with him. And uh, I, 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 didn't, I didn't, I mean, he was not, you know, wanting to open up his life. And I have like five minutes from, my, from the time that I uh, entered the airport till the time I reached the boarding gate. Okay, five minutes, you know. And in that five minutes, I just said, hey, this is who I am, and this, this is what happened in my life, this is who I was, this is what God did in my life. And, and by the time we reached the boarding gate, that guy started crying. He, he started saying, you know, will this ever happen to me? I've been addicted to drugs, and I've been struggling with this. I'm, I, I don't know, I've lost all my relationships. My mother doesn't trust me anymore. I've lost this job previously once, and... This is the second time I'm doing this. And this guy just started opening up his life. Now, that doesn't happen all the time. I would share my story to so many people, but one out of 10, one out of 15, 20 people would say, wow, I, I, I need what you have. And, you know, my immediate, you know, temptation is to now, you know, make him into a Christian. But that's what we have to resist. That's where we have to just say, okay, my, it is my job to witness it is my job to tell somebody about Jesus. Now it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict that person. It is the Holy Spirit's job to make him a Christian. How many of you know that you cannot save anybody? 
That you didn't die on the cross for anybody. You cannot save anybody. Only Jesus can save people. Only Jesus is powerful enough to save. So when somebody doesn't respond to your witnessing, you don't have to feel burdened about it. Your job is to be a witness. It is his job to make that witnessing powerful and effective. See, this is the thing. When God came to Paul, God could have just said, hey, now that you've met me, follow me, do everything that I am asking you to do. And yet, God wanted him to go and speak to an Ananias. When God spoke to Cornelius, an angel was sent to Cornelius. God could have just shared the whole gospel to Cornelius directly through that angel. And yet God said, no, you need to sit and talk to a Peter. Let Peter come and witness to you. So it's very necessary. Our witness is very, very necessary. Can God save the whole world without our help? Yes, He can. And yet, He's depending on your witness. He's depending on each and every one of us. You should remember, I I know I'm not trying to guilt trip you into doing this, but you should remember that every second, every second there are people dying in our nation. Every second there are people that are going to hell for eternity without hearing Jesus. Every second. One, uh, about 12 years back when I first moved to Bangalore, there was this, uh, there was this man uh, that we used to feed uh, idlish, you know. We, every, he, he used to sit outside where we uh, lived and, you know, we used to give him idli. Like every morning we, when, when we go and have our breakfast, we'll just buy an extra idli and we'd give him. And uh, there was this one night when I, I was just you know, so specifically impressed upon my heart that I need to take my blanket and go and give it to him. So I said, man, you know, I only have one blanket. I brought my one blanket from Mumbai to Bangalore, and I'm not used to the cold in Bangalore. And I just have this one blanket. Uh, And I just felt that I need to give this to that guy. And I said, okay, I have some money with me. I'll probably buy a new one, and then I will give this old one off to him. So I'm I'm just reasoning this in my head, and I went off to sleep. And this was such a strong feeling. And, I mean, this guy is somebody that we've just been giving breakfast to. You know, nothing more than that. We've not had conversations. It's, uh, he's not somebody, like, I didn't know his language or his, or, you know, his needs. So I couldn't really engage in a conversation with him. But I, I used to just do this for him. And then the next morning, I... You know, uh, I, when, when we went out to sea and we, we were trying to give him breakfast, he's not there. So I thought probably he's not there. Two days later, three days later, he's still not there. So then I asked a shopkeeper, what about this guy? He used to be there every day. And he said, three nights back, there was a cold wave. And during that cold wave, it became so chilly at night that he passed away. And I'm like, man, I, I, I didn't know that that small thing that the Lord was putting in my heart could have had such an impact. They, that's what they suspect. They suspect that it was out of the cold of the night or, or whatever happened to him that night that he passed away the next morning. They, they carried him off and my heart just broke. I was like, this, this, this was in my hands. I could have done something about this. And from that day, I, I've learned to, to not to not take any inspiration from the Lord for granted. It's okay if, if it doesn't work out. If it's, it's okay if it doesn't save anybody's life. But even if it's just one small, tiny thing that the Lord is asking me to do, it is necessary that I just go out of my comfort zone, look foolish, look stupid, look like I, I don't know what I'm doing, just to be able to hear God and do what He's asking me to do. So the first thing that the Lord is calling us into is a lifestyle of witnessing. We cannot make this a a Sunday affair. We cannot make it an affair for just those days when we are going out to do special outreach, special meetings or special evangelism. It has to become a part and parcel of our life. You have Swiggy guys coming home, make sure to give them a tract or a Bible or do something. You know, that's, that's what we do back home. They don't have time to interact, we bless them with a Bible, you know, a a, a tract sometimes they can throw away, but a Bible, it goes back to their homes and sometimes they reach us, 
you know, there's a phone number we have left. Sometimes they call us back. Any Amazon delivery guys that come home, we give them a Bible. Anybody that we are interacting with in an Uber ride or, 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 or on a plane drive, plane, uh, or on a flight or anywhere that whenever we have a neighbor, hey, just have a conversation. It just takes three minutes, four minutes. It doesn't, it is not going to hurt you to just talk about Jesus. Like I said yesterday, nobody dies out of embarrassment. Nobody dies because you're, you're, you're too, you know, ashamed. You, you're not going to be hurt because something that you said or did did not make sense. You know, my, my biggest care is uh, on long flights. When I have to be on an eight-hour flight, and then the Lord begins to talk to me about the person sitting next to me, and I'm like, Lord, let me... Near to the landing, I'll probably start a conversation because if I start a conversation now, I can't sleep the entire flight. <laughs> so sometimes it requires for us to get out of our comfort zone and say, okay, it's, I, I'm, just going to, I'm just going to do something that even if it is going to cost my sleep, even if it's going to cost my comfort, I'm willing to do this. I'm going to take this step of faith. So you are called out of darkness into his marvelous light. So what should you do? Now you should show forth the goodness and the praises of the one who has called you. Now I've realized that our passion for witnessing, it decreases or it grows faint when we are surrounded by people who are not witnessing anymore. You know, I have... Um, uh, last night I was just talking to the pastors and, and they asked me, when, when did I first or originally start, you know, praying over people or prophesying? And I, and I was telling them how back in the day, you know, during the days, during co-workers and Joshua generation and you know, all of their camps that I used to hang out with them and they would host prophets and pastors and, and, and they would come and pray for people and minister to them and give them a word of knowledge. So I would be hanging out with these guys all the time and eventually, automatically, I just started trusting God for a word for someone else. You know, it's one thing to trust God for a word for myself, but then I began to ask God for a word for someone else. And, and your fellowship, who you fellowship with, who you hang out with is very, very important. If you're always hanging out with people who are shy of the gospel, who are, who are afraid of witnessing, then you are going to be afraid of witnessing with, you know? If you're going to be hanging out with people who are passionate about witnessing, passionate about church, passionate about God, eventually you are going to be passionate about God yourself. So we had an amazing two, three days here. But when we go back from here, there is an invitation from the Lord to continue in fellowship. It is necessary that we continue in fellowship. The first calling is a calling to witness. The second calling is a calling to fellowship. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 25, it says, And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. You know, we think, what's the big deal? It's just one week, right? It's just one weekend. What's the problem if I miss one service, but God's word says, let us not ignore or neglect or, you know, devalue our meeting together as some people do. But we have to make sure to encourage one another, especially now that the day of the Lord is returning near. So some people, what they do is they neglect the meeting together. But this community, we have to be different. We have to encourage one another. So Every Saturday night or, you know, when, if your service is on Sunday morning, Saturday night, make sure to text someone else and say, hey, are you, are you coming to church tomorrow? What are you wearing to church tomorrow? How, you know, how can I pick you up on, on the way to church? How can we do this together? Let's, 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 you know, I mean, guys, for guys, this is a big deal. We, guys, sometimes we wear matching outfits. We... You know, I, I don't know how girls do this, but you, you, can, you can plan for ways to encourage one another. The Bible says, I was glad when they said to me, come, let's go to the house of the Lord. So will you be that one person who is going to 
encourage one another and, and call each other to fellowship. Call each other to fellowship. And sometimes this fellowship needs to go beyond the Sunday mornings. It needs to go into your Wednesday night Bible study or your Friday night prayer or your Saturday uh, you know, evening when you're going out to evangelize or do outreach. It's, it's necessary that you fellowship with people that have the heart for God that you want to have. Because eventually, if you don't fellowship with these guys, if, you don't, if your fellowship is only with people who want to make money, then you will become like them. If your fellowship is only with people that want to just do well in life, then you will eventually become like them. Your fellowship is very, very important. I have seen so many people who are set on fire in a youth camp, and they go back out, and they lack fellowship, or they don't value fellowship, and they lose the amazing blessings that they received during the time that they were in a youth camp. But my prayer is that none of us will be caught in that trap, that there is, the Lord is inviting us into a life of fellowship. The first century church, they did not just, you know, thank God for the salvation and do witnessing and just continue. They continued in fellowship to the point that they sold everything that they had for the sake of that fellowship. They gave up their houses, their properties, they sold everything, gave it to the apostles and said, okay, let's live together. They had fellowship seven days a week. You know, we crib about that one hour of Zoom meeting we have to sit through, right? They, they had their fellowship, their church was 24-7. They lived in church. That is the kind of fellowship these guys had. I'm sure they were doing rehearsal for heaven because that's how heaven is going to be like. Heaven is going to be 24-7 fellowship for all eternity. So, so when we fellowship, it is in fact a, a tiny glimpse and a small replica of heaven here on earth. So the Lord is calling us into fellowship. Now, I understand fellowship is not going to be perfect. No fellowship is going to be perfect. If there is a fellowship that is perfect, then don't go into that fellowship because when you go, it will become imperfect. Uh, there is absolutely no fellowship that has everything in the right place. You know, if you ever organize a party, you know that something or the other has to go wrong. Either the food doesn't arrive on time or the guests don't come on time or something or the other will go wrong in fellowship. Something or the other will go wrong during the worship. Something or the other will go wrong or every Sunday, that is okay. We are imperfect people. We don't fellowship because we are perfect. We fellowship because there is a need to encourage each other, to strengthen one another. Amen? But the thing is that so many of us, we are okay with fellowshipping. We are okay in coming to church. We are okay in our meeting together. But we don't go any step further beyond that. But when we live a life like that, where we're just fellowshipping, 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 but nothing is changing with the way that you're doing things. You're not, you're, you're, you're just coming in to receive some encouragement and going back into the world, then I, I don't think we are doing a good job at being the church, which is the body of Christ. See, the church is, is not supposed to be made of individuals. Apostle Paul would explain this in Corinthians, in the book of Corinthians, saying, we are one body with different parts of the body. Now, all these parts of the body, it has a function. Now, your, your lungs has a function, your kidneys have a function, your, your eyes or your uh, organs that are visible on the outside, your hands, your, your, your ears, they have another function. All of our, all the parts of our body has a function. And it is necessary for us to understand what is my function in the church? What is my role? What is my calling in the church? And I need to begin to use those things to the best way possible. So the third thing that the Lord is calling us to is a call to stewardship. The first thing is a call to witness. The second is the call to fellowship. And the third is a call to stewardship. I'll not take a lot of time in explaining this, but I'll, I'll, I'll take some time to read a few scriptures to you. This is Romans chapter 12, 
verse 6 onwards till verse 8. It says, in His grace, God has given us different gifts. All of us, nobody is exempt here. Every single one of us have different gifts. It says, in His grace, in His divine plan, in His div divine sovereignty, He has given us different gifts. And our job is to make sure that, you know, we use these gifts. It says, in His, in His grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. Some of us, God will give you the ability to prophesy, which means when you pray for people or when you're in church, you, you may see an image, you may hear a word for someone else, you, you may hear a word for the city, for the church, for the nation. It says, speak out with as much faith as you can muster. Don't withhold. The next line, it says, if your gift is serving others, then serve them well. Some of us, our gift may just be to, you know, encourage, uh, you know, the mothers that come into our church by just carrying their children and just say, guess what? You just worship here, we'll carry your baby. You know, you, seven, six days a week, you've been carrying your child. Today, during the service, let me carry your child. You be free. You just worship. I'm going to serve you. So now you're not just coming to church to, you know, just have a good time. Now you're coming to church. Now you're fellowshipping so that you can serve. Because some of us, we have a gift of service. Everybody will not prophesy. But some of us may prophesy, and some of us will be given the gift of serving. So it's necessary. No gift is better than the other. Like, you know, Paul explains in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and 14, hey, the hand cannot say to the eye, because I'm not the eye, I'm not part of the body. Each part of the body is equally important. We, 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 we sometimes just categorize the certain, certain gifts or certain abilities as, as the most spiritual abilities, right? Oh, wow, he can prophesy, which means that is better than my ability to carry the children in the church. But guess what? The Bible says both of them are equally valuable. The both, both of them are gifts from the grace of God. It says in His grace, God has given all of us certain gifts. Nobody is exempt. Every one of us have a gift from the Lord. So, you, so the question really is, are you using your gift to the fullest potential to benefit and bless the church? Or are you just using the gifts just to make money. You know, all the things that we do from Monday to Saturday, you know, in our careers, in our jobs, they, they are our gifts. Some of us are very talented with our art, with our uh, music, with our creativity. Some of us, you know, we, we can dance. Not talking about me, myself, but some of you guys. You can dance. Come on. I mean, we need some people who will choreograph in the church. We need people who will teach our young people, our children to do something creative to, to, to serve our churches in a way that, that we, that, you know, will begin to translate the love of Jesus with all the gifts that we've been given. The Bible says if some of your gift is to serve, then serve others well. It says if you are a teacher, then teach well. Do your hundred percent job at teaching. If you are called to teach, give you 100 percent to do that. Verse 8, if your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. Man, I love this. This group of people in the church is the awesomest. Because they'll just hang out and they'll be the encouragers. They'll be like, man, it's okay. I know. It's okay. Don't worry. You will do well. They speak life. They just, I feel that every one of us can do this, right? I mean, we, do, we don't need someone to come lay hands on us saying, now you're going to have a gift of encouragement. Come on. All of us can function in the gift of encouraging. When we come to church, we can steward this gift well. So the Lord is asking us, hey, if, you're, if your gift is to encourage, then make sure to be encouraging. If it is giving, then give generously. Some of us, we have a gift of giving. And then if your gift is to give, then do that with the best way possible. Steward that gift best. It says, 
If God has given you the leadership ability, then take that responsibility seriously. Like all of us are not leaders. Some of us have to be really trained with a lot of attacks to become good leaders. But some of us are naturally good leaders. And if the Bible says, if that is the gift that God has given you, then take all the responsibility that comes to you very serious. And if you have a gift of showing kindness to others, wow, this is, a, this is an amazing group of people. Because it says, this group, they will, they will have people over to their home. When they see that somebody is sick, they will be the first one to vi visit them. When they see that someone doesn't have food to eat, they will be the first one to cook or to, you know, swiggy them a meal or do whatever it takes to show kindness. It says, if your gift is to show kindness to others, then do it gladly. Not with a grudge saying, oh my God, this problem case is back. You know, don't do it with a grudge because if you do it with a grudge, it doesn't hold any value. Do it gladly. So the Lord is not just calling us to witness, He's also calling us to fellowship, and further on, He's calling us to stewardship, where we steward the gifts that He has given us, and we multiply those gifts so that it can eventually become a blessing to the body of Christ. We can't say that I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. Like, it would be funny if I say, I love your face, but I don't like your body, because you, that's, that's what we say when I say I love Jesus, but I don't love the church. Because the church is the body of Christ. Yeah, the body is not perfect. Yes, the body is not working out. Yes, the body is eating all kinds of junk and there are, there are extra weight on this body. But yeah, because I love the face, I love the body. As much as, you know, this body may not look perfect, I will still love the body because... I love the head of this body. I love the face of this body. I love the one who, who, who loved me, and that is Jesus. And the church is the body of Christ. So if we love Jesus, our response is not just to be a Mary who sits at the feet of Jesus, but we also need to be a Martha who will go and serve. We also need to be a Martha who will cook, who will give generously, who will take our leadership seriously, who will prophesy, who will pray, who will do everything possible to serve, show kindness, and, and make sure that, that you use the grace that has been given to you. Are you ready for the next one? This is where it gets a little serious. This is for the serious folks, okay? This is the fourth level of calling that the Lord is inviting us into today, and it is the calling to mentorship. The first is the calling to <clears throat> witnessing. Second, the calling to, <coughs> sorry. The second is the calling to fellowship. The third is the calling to stewardship. The fourth is the calling to mentorship. Apostle Paul, <coughs> he, would, he, would, uh, he would talk, he would write to the church at Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 and verse 1. And he said, imitate me as I imitate Christ. Follow my example. Just be like me. You walk with me close enough. You just watch every step that I take so that eventually, because I'm following Jesus, because I'm imitating Jesus, you will end up imitating Jesus and you will end up becoming like Jesus. The calling, the calling to being mentored, the calling to mentorship, it's a very serious calling. <coughs> Sorry about that. When we, when we, you know, study the model of Jesus' life, he did not go about just serving the huge crowd. He loved the crowds. He showed compassion on the crouch, but his focus from the very beginning was to make disciples. His focus from the very beginning was to mentor the 12 and just <clears throat> pour himself completely over into these 12 people and just train them to function like him. 
train them to teach like him, train them to behave like him. Every person in the church that wants to steward their gifts well, you need a mentor. You need to ask God to show you mentors. Not one mentor, but plural, mentors. Like there are areas of your life that not everybody can give you everything. Like when we're growing up, we go to someone else for math tuition. We go to someone else for learning guitar. We go to someone else for learning uh, swimming. So, so we need mentorship. Even in the church, we need mentorship. See, you should understand everything that you're doing in, and you know, you're, you're serving the church with, you need someone who will help you and guide you in that process. So if you're just like a Sunday to Sunday Christian where you're coming to church Sunday by Sunday, you're attending all the fellowships, you're even serving, and now you want to go to the next level, now here is what you need to do. Seek out help from your leaders. And you tell them, I want, this is what I've been doing, now I want to do this better. And seek out counsel, seek out advice on what you've already been engaged in. When you do this, now your ability to serve will go to the next level. Now you're, you're, you're picking up skills from someone else who has gone through that journey. All those of you who are planning to get married sometime or the other, make sure to get help for your marriage. Make sure when you're dating someone, don't do it without a mentor's help in your life. I mean, I know that we understand how dating and marriage works because we watch plenty of movies. But guess what? Marriage is a spiritual thing. What else, where else can we receive help for how to get married, who to get married to, and, and what are the right ways, what are the right things to do, what are, what are the things to avoid, except from godly leaders that God has given us in the church. It is necessary that you learn to receive mentorship. So some of us, we struggle with our finances. We have credit card debts that we don't want to, you know, even think about. We don't even want to acknowledge it's there. Man, seek out a mentor for your finances. Someone who is a godly, uh, is steward with his finances. Seek out a mentor for that. Someone who is struggling with addiction. You know you can't overcome this yourself. Seek out a mentor for that. Seek out someone else who has overcome addictions and you're saying, okay, I, I'm, I'm going to expose myself. I'm going to become vulnerable. With my mentors, I have to be 100% open. Something that you know, I'm really blessed with is, is this uh, grace to have known a lot of giants in the Lord. You know, giants who've like done great things for the Lord. And walking closely with many of them, one thing that I have always seen as a pattern is that the ones that are out there serving the Lord, the ones that are genuine in their passion and their service for God, they are always open to feedback. They are always open to correction. No matter how, may, how, how old they are, some of them may be 60, 70, or they, they, they may have been doing ministry for a really long time, but they are always open to feedback and for mentorship and for correction. I was really humbled when a man of God, uh, he served in Maharashtra for over 40 years. He's retired and in our city in Bangalore. And he came and sat down with me and he said, Raji, you need to teach me how to now take my ministry online. I've never done this before. Teach me. And I I'm telling him, Pastor, we will do everything for you. You, you just preach. We will serve you. you know, we have an amazing team. He's like, no, no, no. You teach me. I, I, I want to learn this myself so I can go and teach my pastors back in Maharashtra. And I'm like, this guy is going to come and sit with me. Uh, he is an elderly pastor. And he's saying, this is one area where I have not, you know, done well at. You guys are doing well at this. You are doing, you're being online. You, you're serving uh, the digital world. So I want to learn from you. And he is coming and he's saying, will you please teach me? how to do this. Will you please teach me what to do? Will you please teach me uh, what to buy, what not to buy? And I'm like, I was, I was like, this guy, he, he is serious about where he's headed. You are never too old for mentorship. 
You're never too old to grow. You're never too old to be taught the word and, and to be taught the right way of living. I'll finish with this last one. The Lord is calling us to submission. Submission. Let me read the scripture. This is Hebrews chapter 13 and verse 17. It says, Obey your spiritual leaders and do what they say. Their work is to watch over your souls and they are accountable to God. Give them reason to do this with joy and not with sorrow. That would certainly not be for your benefit. So there is a step beyond mentorship and it is a place of coming under submission. Mentors can give you counsel and advice, but you're not obliged to obey everything. But when it comes to your spiritual leaders or those that God has appointed and give them, given them authority over your life, like, for example, it could be a pastor, it could be a spiritual father or a spiritual mother. See, the Bible says you can have amazing 10,000 teachers, but you can have only one father. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, you can have so many leaders in one area, so many different areas, but you can have only one voice that you will submit to. And in every aspect, every area, we have, we have people of authority that God has placed over our lives. If you're a child, you have your parents that are, that are placed over your life. If you are a married person, there is godly authority within marriage. It says wives, they submit to their husbands. If, if, you are, if you're part of a church, then there is an authority figure in the church that God has placed to, so that you can submit to them. Wherever you are, if you're citizens of a nation, there is an authority that God has placed over the nation that you should submit to and you should obey. Wherever you are, the Lord has placed authority figures. Now it is necessary that we seek out submission even in our spiritual life where yes we will be mentored in different areas but there has to be that one person that we will go to and that person gets to have the final say for me it is my spiritual father and when it comes to him I don't reason with him I don't go to him and say but this is what I wanted to do when he says drop it I'll just drop it I there's no arguments when it comes to him when he says don't do this even if it is something that is very frivolous, very, uh, you know, very negligible, something that I can neglect, I will not reason with him because when it comes to my authority, I know that I am under authority and I can exercise my fullness, my full potential only to the extent that I remain under authority. And it is very necessary, my friends, that we go beyond mentorship and we reach, eventually, we reach a place where we are able to come under spiritual leadership to, to say, okay, here it doesn't say, just consider their advice and pick and choose which one you like and which one you don't like. It says, obey them. And when you obey them, it will be a blessing to you. It will, it will sustain you for a really, really long time. And I've, I've walked with so many people who have... Who have uh, neglected this principle of submission. You know, they, they will submit only to the point that their mentor or their leader tells them something they don't agree with. As soon as they say, don't do this, they'll say, okay, I don't want this mentor anymore. I don't want this leader anymore. And they'll just walk off. And I've never seen them uh, be, be planted, be rooted, be, uh, to, 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 to prosper in the same place for a really long time. The Bible says when you obey your parents, you will, you will have long life. So in other words, if you obey, if you have a spiritual parent and if you obey them and if you submit yourself to them, you will have long life in your career, in your ministry, in your marriage, whatever areas of your life you're, you're, you, you, where you need help, you will have long life over there. So what are the five things that I taught you today? There is a call to witness. There is a call to fellowship. There is a call to stewardship. There is a call to mentorship. There is a call to submission. 
So Apostle Paul says, I press on to the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. I forget the past. I forget how I used to live my life till today. But now I press on towards this upward call of God that is in Christ Jesus. Now I'm going to commit myself to a life of witnessing. I'm going to commit myself to fellowship. I'm going to commit myself to stewardship, to mentorship, and further on going on to even submission. I mean, these are all spiritual principles that you have to take time to meditate and grow and ask God for revelation on how to do this better, how to practically do this on a daily basis. And if you are willing to do it, the Holy Spirit is your helper. The Holy Spirit is the one who will encourage you, empower you, strengthen you, enable you to be able to do this. These are spiritual principles and it can only be done when we yield to the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Let's pray. Just keep your hands up in the air. Father, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And right now, we just release that grace upon your dear children in this place, all over this place. We thank you for you are going to cause each and every one of your children to be a hundred percent fruitful. Not 30 times, not 60 times, but a, a hundred times the fruit. In Jesus' mighty name, I, I speak increase and multiplication upon them. And I pray, Lord, that you would call each and every one of them into a life of witnessing, into a life of, of fellowship, into a life of stewardship of the gifts that have been given to them, into a life of mentorship where they receive uh, counsel and advice and a life of submission because we know when we submit under your mighty hand you will lift us up in the right time we bless your dear children in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit this week when they go back to their church they will be a blessing to their church this week when they go back to their home they will be a blessing to their families this weekend when they go back and they hang out with their friends they will be a blessing a, a true blessing to their friends. So I bless them with this word. And in Jesus' mighty name we pray. And everybody said, and amen. Amen.